It's Friday, Good Friday, arguably the most important day of the year for Christians as we reflect on the meaning and the wonder of Jesus' death for us. But today, unlike every other Easter, this church, All Saints Anglican in Nowra, in the Shoalhaven, will be empty because you're in your living rooms. We're cut off from each other. You see, something infectious has swept through the whole world and its impact has been to rob us of normal life and relating to one another. And it has robbed many of life itself. Jordan, come in. Two metre rule, okay? In some ways, a virus that sweeps through the world and infects humanity portrays the whole Good Friday story. A different kind of virus. The Bible calls it sin. And no one is immune. Everyone is infected. And its impact is to rob us of normal life and relating. And it cuts us off from God. And ultimately, it's fatal. But there is a cure.
Well, welcome everyone to our Good Friday service. It's a really uh, important day in our calendar, isn't it? To gather together, even as we scattered in different lounge rooms across the Shoalhaven, to remember what takes place on this important day. That is the remembering of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever you are, um, my prayer for you and for all of us is that this, this day is a real blessing for us as we remember the Lord Jesus together. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we remember today our Lord Jesus and consider again together his dying on the cross, we think of his head, his hands, his feet, his life given for us. We pray that you would help us all to see both the sorrow and the love. In our homes, in our families, we pray that you'd give to us that comfort and consolation that is ours in Christ and in this time of uncertainty, we pray that you might give us rock solid hope and confidence in your plans for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together now. So wherever you are in your lounge rooms, if you'd like to, please stand as we sing together in Christ alone.
Well, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to say together in our homes the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is an affirmation of the Christian faith. So if you'd like to, please be upstanding, as this is a normal custom and tradition, as we remind one another what it is that we believe. Let's say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, why don't you take a seat wherever you are as we move to this next part of our time together, which is an opportunity for us to remember and remind one another of God's grace to us. As people who are Christians, people who've put their faith in the Lord Jesus, we remember that we are the forgiven people, that we've been saved from our sin, and that we've been enabled to live today in a way that pleases God and blesses our neighbours, our family, and our friends. But we don't always do this as well as we would like to or want to. And so one of the things that we do as Christians is we have learned to say sorry to one another and to say sorry to God. And so what I would like to do is to give you an opportunity now, wherever you are in your homes, perhaps you have family around you, just to consider your own life and your own week and think, is there anything that you need to say to the family in your room today? Is there something that you need to say sorry for? an angry word, maybe a rough tone here or there. Maybe it was something that you did. So what you could do now is you can just hit pause on this video and just take a moment just to chat together with the people in your family, say sorry, and then after that, we're going to say sorry to God together. Well, I hope that was a helpful thing for you to do in your family. As the people of grace, there is great freedom for us to offer forgiveness to one another when we confess our sin to one another. But now it's time for us to pray to God. So let's pray together with the words of this prayer, which is a confession that we say before God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we humble our hearts before you, we ask you to cleanse our hearts and renew our minds by your spirit. Help us to live the lives worthy of the gospel you've called us to. Help us to repent of being self-centered and to learn to be other person centered. We thank you for the grace in which we stand as we call you Saviour and Lord. Amen. Well, dear friends, the good news of Good Friday is that because of God's love for us, Jesus has taken the punishment that was ours because of our sin. He took it with him to the cross. He offered up himself as our punishment. And the forgiveness he gives to us is our permanent possession as God's loved people. This is God's grace to us. So today, hold firm to this good news. We're going to continue to pray together now and Pauline is going to lead us in prayer. Thanks, Pauline. Jesus said, No one comes to the Father except by me. Lord God, thank you that you have made it possible for us to come to you through Jesus. In dying on the cross, Jesus met the need for justice with sacrificial love. 
Thank you, God, for the recent rain in many places that were still suffering through drought. We ask that you'll continue to send drought-breaking rain so that those who make their living from the land will be able to do so again. We also pray for those who are still recovering from the devastating bushfires. Give them strength as they try to rebuild homes and lives, as well as dealing with COVID-19. Lord God, as the whole world has been affected by COVID-19, we realise that mankind cannot and does not control this world. You do. We do not know your plan in all of this, but can confidently trust you and that you will not allow this situation to stop the spread of your word. We ask that the unprecedented cooperation between many nations will result in ongoing sharing of resources. Give wisdom to the leaders of the nations of the world so that all they do now and into the future will be for the good of those they rule, seeking your justice and peace in every law and action. We thank you for all the frontline people treating patients. We ask for your protection over them and their families. We also ask for success in research into finding a vaccine. Thank you for the different ways technology has helped so many to feel less isolated in this difficult time. We are grateful for the gifts given to the members of All Saints, which have enabled services to continue, albeit in different ways. Please give wisdom and creativity to all those involved in reaching out to the community with your gospel in this way. Please inspire our staff and volunteers as we seek ways of providing the many ministries which were once a big part of our church life in a way that will protect our community and advance your kingdom. The urgency of your message to those outside your kingdom has prompted missionaries to go to all parts of the world. We think of those we support, Dave, Liz, Matt, Donna, Ned, Tawanda and Shupi and their families as they serve in countries so culturally different, as well as Kristen and Kath and their children in the Northern Territory. We ask that your Holy Spirit will work in the hearts of those they are trying to reach with the gospel so that all nations will be represented on the day when we see Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven. For those who work in areas where there is great opposition to your word and physical danger is a real issue, we ask that you will protect and guard them. Father, we pray for those who are sick in body, mind or spirit. Especially we pray for those suffering as a result of COVID-19. We also bring before you the family and friends of our sister in Christ, Cynthia Holmes, as they mourn her passing. May her steadfastness in faith over many years be an example for us. Please bring those in need your peace in their pain, your strength in their weakness, and your comfort in their sadness. Help us to love and support them in whatever ways we can. Thank you also, Lord, for the example of joyful Christian living that Don and Rosalie Sims have been over decades. We ask that you'll be with them as they move to Canberra this week. Help them settle in there, and when their virus crisis is over, help them to find a church where they can continue to worship and serve you. Lord, each day, when we wash our hands, help us to remember that Jesus has washed away our sins by his blood, shed so freely on the cross. Amen. Thanks, Pauline. Well, it's now time for the kids to take out their packs, which uh, Emily has been able to deliver to your homes during the week. And so you can work on those kids' activities now and continue to learn about what Good Friday means in that. And for, the, for those of us who are going to be listening to the sermon together, now's the opportunity for you to take your Bibles out and to turn with me to Mark chapter 15. And Tim is going to be reading for us 
Over the past few weeks, we've been working our way through the gospel of Mark, encountering the Jesus that we least expected. And so let's see now what's in store for us as we read Mark's gospel together. Thanks, Tim. The reading comes from Mark, chapter 15, verses 1 to 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified.
This reading is from Mark chapter 15, verses 16 to 32. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They pulled a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 33 to 41. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, They said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man is the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Jose and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. This is the word of God. Good morning on this Good Friday. I'm going to begin by praying. Almighty God, our Father, we pray that you would help us to see Jesus with new eyes. Make our ears tingle and our hearts race as we hear your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, wherever you are today on this Good Friday, we're glad you've joined us. And over the past few weeks, we've been exploring Mark's gospel through the theme of the Jesus you least expected. And the phrase least expected means something to us right now, doesn't it? 2020 is the year we least expected. The thing that I least expected when I went on my Christmas holidays was to be evacuated onto a beach with hundreds of panicking holidaymakers in smoke and darkness. You know what I'm talking about, the black summer bushfires. And for some of you in this town, the least expected thing was that you would one day wake up on the floor of the Bomaderry Bowling Club. Well, perhaps from time to time that does happen to you, but I mean as an evacuation centre crammed with lots of people. And some of you least expected that your homes would be destroyed by fire. Everything you own, gone. And now the new least expected is that we'd be sitting in our homes for months confined, isolated from our friends, doing church in our living room. At least that's where I think you are right now. You might be in your jammies in bed for all I know. But the point is we're getting to know how least expected works right now. It's when you, you arrange your life and your hopes and your dreams around a single ideal scenario only to discover that reality is very different. You know, Jesus was the least expected Messiah for the Jewish people. They had such a fixed, single scenario about what the Messiah would be like and what he had come to do that they didn't have room for God's reality. But as we've been reading in Mark's Gospel, at every turn, Jesus defied expectations. He taught like they'd never heard before, as one with authority. He dined with sinners. He broke the Sabbath and dared to forgive sins. He said he was the the new wine in old wineskins. His new way would burst the old way. He defied the expectations of the crowd. He defied the expectations of institutional religion. And he defied the expectations of his own disciples. Oh yeah, his closest. When he told them what he had come to do, which was to die, it was too much for them. And so one betrayed him, one denied him, and the rest deserted him. They had warrior king expectations for Jesus, but Jesus had a different agenda. And in that moment, the real Jesus was not enough for them until they finally understood what he had done for them. And then he was no longer the Jesus they least expected in a bad way, but he was the Jesus they least expected in a good way, a good Friday kind of way. He was so much more than they expected. I wonder if as modern people, we have a different kind of expectation problem with Jesus. We have preconceived views of Jesus. Maybe you see Jesus as silent in stained glass windows, aloof. Maybe you see Jesus as the one who wants to spoil all our fun lives, boring. Maybe you see Jesus as a cruel genie who doesn't grant your wishes, disappointing. But these expectations are connected no more to reality than the first century expectations were connected to reality. You know, if Good Friday is anything, it's a good day to discover the Jesus you least expected, to discover that he is more than you ever expected. So we're going to think about the Jesus that Pilate least expected. And so we turn back to Mark's gospel in chapter 15 and we read in verse 1, very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus and turned him over to Pilate. 
You see, to Pilate's surprise, the religious leaders have delivered Jesus to him to make an official condemnation and execution. See, the backstory to this point is that Pilate was trying to keep Jerusalem locked down peacefully during this volatile religious festival known as the Passover. And he sensed trouble and he knew a mob like this could easily be ignited by a spark. And the word was that Jesus could just be that spark. Pilate's intel would have told him that only a couple of days earlier, Jesus had arrived in Jerusalem and incited by the crowd or inciting the crowd, this mob started chanting a zealot's mantra. Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the king. Hadn't Jesus gone straight to the temple and overturned the money changers? Classic political move to take on the power base. So Pilate had one eye on the treacherous religious leaders and the other eye on the contender, Jesus, who was growing in power. Jesus was Pilate's risk factor. But now the risk factor had been brought to him for trial. Now Pilate gets to interrogate Jesus the enigma. All the stories about Jesus being a great orator, leader, healer, miracle work. Now let's see who this Jesus really is. Let's test his character. Will he crack under the pressure of coming before the might of Rome? But once again, Jesus defies expectations. He makes no defence. So picking up in verse 2 to 5, Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus made no reply and Pilate was amazed. Pilate was amazed because he could see through the religious leader's sham about Jesus being a king, being a a challenger to Caesar in verse 7. And he was giving Jesus a voice to defend himself. But Jesus declines. Jesus is not going to play their games. He's not going to play the games of Rome and he's not going to play the religious leader's game. He knew his purpose in that high pressure moment and it was to choose the cross. And this perplexed Pilate. Why go to the cross? It was clear to Pilate that Jesus was not a king in the sense of a rival to Caesar and yet Jesus claimed a sovereignty and he held the dignity of a true king in that moment and he was able to silently stare down the Roman governor. If you want to feel the tension in this stare down moment, you go to uh, John's gospel and read in chapter 19 these words. The Jews insisted, we have a law and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realise I have the power either to free you or crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. 
We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. But it's in Matthew's gospel that we get an insight into the conflict that Jesus had created in Pilate. Pilate wanted to release the innocent man, but in the end, he washed his hands of Jesus. Chapter 27, verse 22 to 24. But what shall I do then with this Jesus who is called the Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Here it is. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and our children. And then he released Barabbas. But Jesus he had flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Pilate turned out to be the greatest hand washer in history. But can you really wash your hands of Jesus just like that? We're hearing a lot about washing our hands right now. 20 seconds with soap thoroughly to remove the virus that is responsible for spreading this infectious disease throughout the world. 1.5 million cases, 76,000 deaths so far in just a few short months. You can wash the coronavirus off your hands with soap and water, but you can't get rid of guilt that easy. We live in a time when guilt is considered obsolete. There's no room for guilt in a totally free and progressive society. But guilt is real because sin is real. Because there is a moral order in the world. There is a thing called right and wrong because there is a moral God at the centre of everything. And it's this idea of washing our hands in the present day in this threat of coronavirus that helps us understand the question that troubled Pilate. Why Jesus would choose the cross? You know, we opened our service by saying that the most infectious killer in the world today is not the coronavirus, it's sin. And Jesus was going to the cross to bring a cure for sin. Water and soap couldn't wash away Pilate's guilt because no amount of washing of the conscience in self-improvement religion or in enlightenment can cleanse a person of sin. No other religion asks the forgiveness question. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse from sin. You see, in the Torah, the Old Testament law, The blood of an innocent, spotless lamb was used to symbolise forgiveness and cleansing from sin. And on the cross, Jesus was giving his precious blood for forgiveness and the cleansing of sin and guilt. You know, the writer was explaining just this in the book of Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 14. He just described the priestly sacrifices and then he writes, how much more than will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God to cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Can you hear what he's saying? You see, What that writer was trying to explain to us was that it was never about the blood of animals. The animals only ever symbolised the sacrifice that God would make himself through Jesus for us, for the ones he loved, to remove the disease of sin, to remove the curse of death and to set them free to become God's sons and daughters, living in true freedom. It was always there in the Old Testament and it's there in Isaiah 53. 
This is, a, this is a long passage, but it's so good to read this on Good Friday. So Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah was describing Jesus' blood poured out for us on the cross, pierced for our transgressions. That's legal language for the penalty of sin paid by him for us. But look at the language in the second last verse, healed. That's the language of a physician. There is a wonderful story of Father Damien who lived and cared for lepers in Hawaii in the last century. After 11 years of caring for the physical, spiritual and emotional needs of the lepers in that colony, Father Damien realised that he had contracted leprosy when he scalded himself with some boiling water and and realised he felt no pain. He continued to care for the lepers despite his own infection. And finally, he succumbed to the disease in April 1889, so close to Easter. To love them, he had to live among them. And in doing so, he was infected by their disease. Such was the depths of his love for them that he risked everything and he paid the highest price. Jesus came and lived among us and took our sickness on himself deliberately. He paid the highest price and in his death, his blood became the cure for sin. What a a great ending to Pauline's prayer earlier when she said that in this time of coronavirus, that every time we wash our hands, we would be reminded that we are washed by the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin. You know, Pilate was, we read, amazed at Jesus' response. He wondered why Jesus would not seize the opportunity to speak up for himself and defend himself and be free. The answer was love. In love, he remained silent and chose the cross for you and I, even when you and I did not love him. There's no instrument that can measure the the depth of Jesus' love and grace. Only the cross can measure the depth of Jesus' love and grace. It's a love that calls you this Good Friday. And it says, come and meet the Jesus you least expected, the Jesus who has eternal life for you and has life in all its fullness. Our Heavenly Father, we prayed earlier that you would give us new eyes to see Jesus. We ask this again this Good Friday. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for that, Jeff. The gospel, that is, the good news of Jesus, is an encounter with the living Jesus. And this Good Friday, we want to invite you to respond to Jesus as Saviour and have him as Lord of your life now. And this is an incredible moment for you to do just that. Jesus is good news in a time of fear and uncertainty and anxiety. And it's good news for life, for always. To become a Christian means, first of all, to ask 
Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And that begins with a prayer of repentance and faith. And I'm going to lead us through a prayer like that now. And you can do that today. So if you'd like to become a Christian today, then please pray this prayer with me. It's a really personal and important prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've made me and loved me. I'm sorry for how I have lived my life. Today, I turn to Jesus in faith and put my trust in his death and in his resurrection for the forgiveness of my sin and to give me eternal life. Fill me with your spirit and help me to live for you as Lord of my life. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, if you've prayed that prayer today for the first time, then this is not just a good Friday. It is a great Friday. It is the best Friday. And we are so delighted to have you join us as part of Jesus' family. Being a Christian means living a changed life, a life of hope, a life of faith, a life of love. And it's lived out with the power of God's Holy Spirit working and enabling us to live for him day by day. So if you've prayed this prayer today for the first time, please don't just keep it to yourself. Share it with your family and share it with us. And we'd love to help you along in your own journey of faith. Well, we're going to sing one last time together. So wherever you are, if you'd like to stand, please do as we sing together the glories of Calvary. Let's stand as we sing. Lord, you're calling me to come and behold the wondrous cross to explore the depths of grace that came to me at such a cost where your boundless love conquered my boundless sin and mercy's arms were open wide my heart is filled with a thousand songs Proclaiming the glories of Calvary With every breath, Lord, how I long To sing of Jesus who died for me Lord, take me deeper Into the glories of Calvary To the glories of Calvary. Sing the glory.
Well, wasn't that wonderful to be able to sing together in that way? Well, normally at the end of our service together on Good Friday, what I would do is I would invite you to join us for some hot cross buns and some tea and coffee and to continue to celebrate and share together. But we can't do that like we normally would today because we're scattered in different places. But I tell you what, if you've got hot cross buns in, in your house, why don't you open them up and share them with whoever's in your home today as we remember the good news of Good Friday together. But now, as we look forward to Easter Sunday and we look forward to gathering together again, let's commit ourselves to God once again as we pray and look forward to reconnecting again on Easter Sunday. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you might go before us now, that you might be with us in our homes and in our lives over this weekend, and that during these strange days that we live in, we pray that you might give us faith in the Lord Jesus, that you might give us hope, that you might give us perseverance, and that you might enable us to live lives of love as we follow Jesus together. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.